Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's Teletown Hall hosted by DEMPED. My name is Christy Whitfield, and I am the director of the Department of Small and Local Business Development. And I am joined today, oh, a little bit of an echo, sorry, <laughs> um, by uh, Tatiana Torres. And we are going to be talking today about economic recovery, as we do many weeks. Um, so we know that this week we started phase two. I guess that was just yesterday. And over the next next few weeks, we're going to slowly um, st start our steady recovery into our next phase. Um, Mayor Bowser has laid out a budget that delineates the efforts around economic recovery and supports communities and industries that have been deeply impacted by the pandemic. Um, we also know that during these times, our small businesses are figuring out ways daily to you know, take those next steps. And today, we are particularly interested in talking about two you know, two components of that recovery. We are joined today by some great panelists. Um, we're going to split our discussion into two parts today. We're going to first talk about lease negotiations, and we are joined by Daryl Maxwell from the DC Pro Bono Law Center and Dan Kaufman from the Veritas Law Firm, and we're going to be talking about lease negotiations, you know, because we know that in these tough times, many of our small businesses find themselves in a, in a position where lease negotiation is a, a component of ongoing operations that, you know, we wanted to make sure that we brought this, this discussion up to the, to the forefront. And then in the second half of our discussion, we're going to be talking about the, the PPP loans, and we have with us Marla Balonik from the LEDC Latino Economic Development Center, and we have Y. Annette Ryan um, from O Earth Creamery and Bakehouse, and I am going to be trying some of those delicious treats at some point in the near future, I hope, um, to talk about the PPP, which we know that, you know, at one point was closed, but we wanted to make sure that anyone on the call and anyone um, watching on Facebook knows that there are still resources available for the PPP, and we wanted to know, we wanted to make sure we talk a lot about that. So let's jump right into this. Um, you know, we know that a lot of people's big part of their expense is the lease that they pay every month. Um, we also know, particularly in retail situations, the amount of, you know, the value of what they're paying for their lease is sort of predicated on how many people they can squeeze into their establishment um, at any given point in time. And so as we are thinking about uh, COVID times and when jamming hundreds of people into small spaces is no longer as safe as it used to be, the value of your space is sort of shifting. And so Daryl and I, as part of our Build Back Better series, had a conversation a few weeks ago and, and we were talking about that and we've invited Daryl to have that conversation as part of the Deputy Mayor's Teletown Hall because this is an important this is an important discussion that, that Daryl's organization has been having and doing trainings on. So Daryl, welcome and tell us a little bit about why the DC Pro Bono Law Center decided to do this training and then what you're talking about and what sort of information that you all have been uh, been sharing with, with businesses and the types of training that you've been made, making available. Director Whitfield, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for, uh, for the invite, and I'm happy to be talking uh, with our small business community today uh, about some of the work that the Pro Bono Center does and how we have, um, as everyone has, um, had to shift during um, the pandemic to provide uh, training and resources and to shift our work um, to the online realm, um, into the remote realm. Um, we have provided uh, assistance to both small businesses and nonprofits since 1999 here in the district. And um, you, your, your initial point about how, how much of a small businesses' budget is totally right as to how much they're usually expending on on their leases. 
um, and how much commercial leasing is important to folks who operate out of spaces, large and small. And so back in um, in March, mid-March, uh, we started to see folks having to close, and the Pro Bono Center had to shift its, uh, you know, both shift its operations to, a rem- to the remote space, but also had to identify for business owners who were starting to call us and let us know um, that it wasn't going to look like they were going to be able to make rent. It looks like they were going to have some challenges um, in having to shift their own businesses, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a clothing store. And, you know, we were all sort of trying to figure out what, what the next steps would be and how best we could sort of help business owners sort these things out with their landlord. So the first thing we did is we started a new program um, to assert our assistance and with the great help of volunteers like Dan Kaufman, who you're going to hear from, uh, we started helping folks review their leases and just to get a, a good sense and idea as to what their potential liabilities might be, where their vulnerabilities might be, and possibly where some avenues for negotiation and strategies and tips might be. Um, and um, over the course of the last, you know, since March 15th, um, both through um, direct consultations with lawyers and with webinars that we've done on commercial leasing, we've been able to serve, you know, over 100 um, small businesses and nonprofits here in the district. Um, I will also say um, that we typically had done a monthly small business clinic that was walk-in, and we started to do that a little bit more regularly, both in the areas um, of real estate, but also in employment law and intellectual property and other areas where, um, you know, there is an immediate need for this leasing help, but there's also a lot of other immediate needs, and we're trying to meet those on a weekly to bi-weekly basis. Um, and um, I think we're doing a fairly good job, um, although the need can, remains to be there. The Pro Bono Center certainly asserts itself as a, as a leader in trying to help the small business community. I'll just lastly say, um, before we turn it over to Dan, um, who has been working a ton and been a really great help um, to us from the Veritas Law Firm, um, that a lot of our online training, both in um, written training as well as um, webinars, have been extremely well attended. A lot of folks have been been home, but that doesn't stop the fact that there there's a great need for learning, for attention, for being able to get questions answered, and we continue to try to focus on that. Um, I know we've got a lot to get through, um, so I'll, I will certainly leave it there, but I wanted to make sure folks got a sense for what the Pro Bono Center does and how we might be able to help. And I'll turn it to Dan to talk to some more of the specifics about lease negotiations and strategies and tips. All right, great. Thanks, Daryl. Um, yeah, I just wanted to do a quick overview of, you know, when we have a uh, small business tenant here in the district, what we're looking at as far as the issues and what the law is now um, related to potential relief. So, um, There's been lots of recent D.C. legislation related to uh, rent and landlord and tenant law in particular, and it's it's changed basically every few weeks, and I will say that it very likely may change again in the future, so just keep that in mind, but I will briefly go through what the law is right now. So a few things. There's been recent legislation related to evictions, commercial rent increases, and then uh, rent deferment slash payment plan. So as of May 13th, uh, no new commercial eviction cases can be filed until 60 days after the mayor's declared public health emergency ends. And that doesn't look like it's going to end anytime in the next few months. So, uh, no evictions can be filed, uh, moving forward until we're, we're past, uh, this public health emergency. Um, beyond that, um, there's also legislation that states that during the public health emergency and for 30 days thereafter, um, rent increases are prohibited for both commercial retail tenants, and I'll note that retail includes restaurants and bars, um, per Chairman Mendelssohn's remarks uh, when the bill was passed, and all other commercial tenants leasing less than 
6,500 square feet. For those same types of tenants, um, retail and less than 6,500 square feet is commercial, um, they're also potentially eligible for uh, a deferment payment plan. Um, so as of a few weeks ago, commercial landlords are required to set up a process to take applications uh, for payment plans and then to provide notice to all potential eligible tenants. Um, they have to offer the payment plans until one year after the public health emergency ends. And the payment plans have to be of a duration of at least one year unless the lease ends earlier. But there's no specific requirement as to when the payment plan has to commence. Um, and a particular note, uh, commercial tenants don't lose any rights under a lease uh, for failure to pay rent, provided that they make their payments pursuant to the payment plan. Um, so be, that's the, where the law stands currently, and again, it may change. But beyond that, what else do you want to be looking for uh, when assessing your lease and going to your landlord? Um, you'll, one, want to review it to make sure there's nothing related to uh, you not having to pay rent or you potentially being able to terminate your lease and that may be found in the force majeure clause, loss of access, casualty condemnation. I will say these likely don't provide relief. Force majeure clauses are typically strictly construed, and there's typically an exception for uh, payment of rent, but there are instances where tenants have been able to utilize those to not pay. Um, in addition, you want to keep in mind what provisions of your lease are affected by a potential default. So for example, um, do you potentially lose your lease extension if you default? Do you potentially uh, lose a, a, what's called a burn down of your security deposit or your personal guarantee? Uh, if you default, these are things to keep in mind um, as you approach your landlord. Um, beyond that, um, think about how much time is remaining in the lease term. If there's only three months left from now, that obviously is completely different than if you uh, have 10 years and you're personal guaranteeing the entire uh, rest of the term. Um, think about what other debts you have. So if you also owe taxes either to the district or the federal government, or if you have an outstanding small business loan, that's going to also affect um, what, if anything, you can do about uh, your rent moving forward. Um, Try to recall what your security deposit is. So if it's substantial, perhaps some of that can be used towards rent currently. And then just think about what other assets you have that you potentially could be losing if your uh, lease is terminated or what else a landlord could go after if you have a personal guarantee. And then lastly, as you uh, think about approaching your landlord, um, keep in mind that, one, there's been a slew of closings in the retail and hospitality space recently. And so uh, a lot of landlords are finding that they're going to have empty spaces and they're thinking about what to do with those. And oftentimes they're not going to want an additional empty space. Um, so think about what leverage you as a tenant may have here as opposed to a normal situation. Um, while it may be strange to think that you have any leverage since you may not be able to pay anything currently, um, think about the fact that Landlords also don't want the space to remain empty for months on end, and that does provide uh, some leverage in the situation. You also want to think about what's the business landscape going to look like moving forward in six months, a year, two years. Can you commit to something in a few months when you don't know what your operations are going to look like? Is there going to be uh, you know, potential second wave that may cause businesses to have to reduce operations again? These are just unknowns. We didn't, no one really knows about right now, but um, something to keep in mind. And then keep in mind uh, the issue of deferment versus abatement. So as I was saying earlier, the law states that um, landlords are required to offer deferment, but that doesn't fully uh, relieve you of having to pay that rent uh, in the future. What uh, oftentimes I'm finding is that tenants, what they really need is some sort of abatement of this uh current period and then setting themselves up for success moving forward um, and understanding what exactly it is that they can afford uh, moving ahead. So 
that's uh, a general overview. Happy to take questions at the end from any of that. So, Dan, in uh, in regular people's language, deferment versus abatement. So, sure. Uh, de- yeah, deferment means we're taking rent that was owed, say for April, May, and June of 2020, and we're pushing it out towards. Um, 2021 or some other future date, you're still owing that rent. It's just not owed as of today. And the landlord, if there's a deferment plan, landlord won't uh, try to kick you out or sue you for that current rent. Abatement means, um, and there's various ways of doing this, abatement typically means in the simplest sense, um, this rent that we're agreeing upon, perhaps it's April through June, perhaps it's longer, perhaps during the whole public health emergency, we're abating that rent. That means we are not requiring you to pay it at all um, in the future, and then we'll deal with accruing rent moving forward. Um, now, having spoken to uh, a few businesses, you know, some people have said to me, you know, I'm afraid to talk to my landlord because I don't know what I can pay, and yeah. I'm already behind, and if I call, I just, I don't, I don't know what to say. And I don't want to make that call. What do you say to that small business person? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's various ways of thinking about that. And obviously it depends on your exact situation. Someone who has a great relationship with their landlord, obviously would uh, probably be much more inclined to directly reach out. Um, my initial inclination is it's probably best to reach out, tell them exactly what your situation is. Well, if, if you can't pay anything, be honest about that because what good does it do you to uh, not relay that information? Um, the other reason to reach out is, you know, landlords are required to offer at least payment plans at this point. So uh, it's not as if the landlord's going to be able to require you to make payments right now for rent that's come up during the public health emergency. So um, it's good to get that conversation going while it's not, uh, required, it, it's probably a good idea um, to be straightforward with your landlord, uh, not push off these conversations for later. Um, and perhaps, you know, there's something good that can come out of initiating these conversations now. You know, some landlords are willing to take back the spaces and relieve you of further obligations on the, the lease um, because they, you know, want to get a new tenant in there. That's not always the case, but it, if it possibly could be the case and you're you potentially would want to get out of that lease that's something uh worth bringing up and and trying to have that discussion i don't see a lot of value in pushing things off when there's no penalty right now for you not paying your rent well and if you can defer until a later time when you can actually be open for business then that's uh you know that's also another good possibility Right. I mean, if the reason that you can't pay rent is that you haven't been able to operate, then I think deferring is a is a, a reasonable is a reasonable plan. Um, tell us what happens when you come in for help. If you walk into the you know, the D.C. Pro Bono Law Center and say, hey, I've got a situation and I have some bills and I don't know what to do. You know what happens? Sure. Uh, Daryl, do you want to take that one? Sure. I'll, 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 I'll uh, start and you can feel free to, to add your fantastic expertise. So typically in these days, somebody will either call or email us and say they need, you know, they've got, you know, I, I can give you a couple of scenarios, but the, the most common is I have a, I have a landlord that's hounding me um, either for back rent or possibly, um, or just reminding me that rent is coming due and even though you'd be surprised, even though landlords are supposed to be kept keep themselves abreast of the law, just just like business owners are, some of them don't. So some some folks haven't received um, information about a payment plan yet. So if somebody will come into us, mention that they're having some difficulty. We will we will do our best to quickly find um, one of our volunteers or somebody on staff to talk um, with that business owner review the lease, explain what their exposure is, what their potential liability is. Also explain to them, as Dan mentioned, um, what the new laws, and again, they have been changing rather quickly, 
um, explain sort of what their rights are, also explain that courts, the courts haven't been opened yet. And so someone, a landlord telling you that you are going to be evicted next week is not true. And you're know, trying to sort of help, help them through and allay some of those fears, explain what their rights and responsibilities are. And then in the event that there's any sort of challenges that we haven't been able to explain with the law, I'll possibly also explain some of those strategies. Um, and again, most of that is going, you know, a good portion of that is going to be either done via conference call or via a, a meeting via WebEx or Zoom or something to that effect. Um, Dan, feel free to jump in with any, any other stuff you'd like to add. No, I, I think that was a great overview. And that's a very good point that not all landlords are aware of what the law is. And so um, it's good for ten A lot of times tenants will say, well, I, I just don't understand why the landlord wouldn't understand what they're legally obligated to do. It's really scaring me what, what they're saying, even though you, the attorney, are telling me otherwise. Um, that's just something to keep in mind because I have been seeing that more and more. Although I think in the last few weeks I have seen more landlords reaching out with their uh, initial notices of payment plans. But yeah, I think the process they all laid out is correct. And then you just get into the exact situation and, and try to figure out um, what type of relief, um, you know, may be required. And, you know, this is commercial leases are, are my day job. And so I'm, I'm, this type of issue is what I'm dealing with primarily just because it's, it's completely taken over the, the real estate. Uh, seen here in the district and so many things are changing and people are trying to figure out uh, what to do moving forward. So it's, it's at the top of it, almost every retail tenant's mind currently. Yeah, I have a quick question for you. Can you talk to us a little bit about the clinics that you'll be holding on July 2nd along with the uh, DC Pro Bono Center and DC Small Development that you have online, the one-on-one -on -one clinics that people have been asking about? Where could people find more information on those clinics? Sure, sure. So you can find information, and thanks for asking, you can find information about our upcoming clinics, specifically our one with our great partners from the Small Business Development Center Network. Um, if you go to our resource site, which is www.lawhelp.org slash DC slash CED, there's a link um, and a, in our um, sort of upcoming events that's going to be high up on the list because that's our, our you know, we, we expect we have been able to mobilize, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 or 40 volunteer lawyers to help with as many um, matters and issues. Again, many of these are real estate matters, but many of them are run the gamut of legal needs because, you know, even though the pandemic has stopped a lot of us from moving sort of freely about, there's still lots of legal issues that folks have. And, I will also say what, is heart, what has been heartening during this time frame is we have had a ton of people who, even with, you know, a lot of the doom and gloom that we see regularly, still want to start businesses and have really great business ideas. And so um, I would encourage folks to go to our Law Help site and, um, and sign up and happy to have all of you. Thank you. Um, for the folks that are on the line, I want to remind people to hit zero if you uh, if you want to be in the queue to ask a question. And then, uh, Daryl, remind everyone also where is the website if they want to see the the web webinar on the um, lease negotiations. Sure. So again, I mentioned our law help site, and you can find all of our resources there at lawhelp.org/dc/ced. Um, our commercial leasing webinar is there, um, and, and most certainly we've got links to a number of other employment law, bankruptcy, and other um, interesting topics, um, particularly, and as well as a, a webinar we just did on reopening um, your workplace. So we're happy to have folks join us there. Great. And now we are going to actually turn to our other guests, We, you know, other uh resources out there. Um, the payroll protection program is something that we know was out there and we had spent an earlier, um, I think a couple of teletown halls talking about SBA resources. The, uh, the EDIL and the PPP have been, you know, in the news and people have talked about this. Um, we wanted to invite uh, Marla Belonik from the Latino Economic Development Center to talk about this resource because 
for a period of time, this resource had been turned off, and we want to make sure people understand that this is something that is actually still available for a short period of time. So, Marla, talk to us a little bit about LEDC, and then let's talk a little bit about this resource and how people might be able to reach out to LEDC if they are interested in, uh, in accessing this. Thank you for joining us, by the way. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Director Whitfield. We're so glad to be a part of the conversation today. Um, and it's a close-to-home conversation because Daryl is actually our board chair, so it's a very, um, you know, family moment right now. Um, anyhow, uh, again, thanks so much. Um, I did want to just mention a little bit about LEDC, although that won't be the bulk of what I'm talking about because I do want to talk about this particular product. But as it pertains to the listeners on the call today, LEDC is a community development financial institution. We offer loans to small businesses from $5,000 to $250,000 for people who are looking to start and expand businesses in the markets that we serve. We're headquartered in Washington, D.C., but also have offices throughout the region as well as in Baltimore City and Puerto Rico. Um, as far as PPP is concerned, um, this is a great program from the Small Business Administration at the federal level that is offering um, funding to support payroll expenses. So that would either be to keep employees on board or in the case of many businesses where they had to let employees go, it would be a way to bring employees back on if they are reopening or planning to reopen in the near future. And so these are forgivable loans. As long as you comply with what's required of you, you will not have to pay these loans back. So that is very attractive. Um, you have to spend at least 60% of the loan that you take out on payroll expenses, and the remainder can be used for general business expenses. Um, LEDC uh, has been in the fortunate position to be able to offer this pro product. Um, we started at the end of April and have given um, around 70 loans, with about half of those going to district businesses. Um, and you'll see in a couple of minutes that we have one of our recipients on the line who can talk about um, the product in more detail and sort of how it's helped her um, during this time. Um, a couple of other things that I wanted to just point out, the deadline to apply to PPP right now unless they make a, an amendment is June 30th, which is right around the corner as we know. Um, you have until the end of the calendar year to hire but you or rehire your employees, but you also have, um, and that's the, also the deadline to use all of the funds. Um, and um, I think that was all I had to say about that deadline. And then the maturity of the loans is five years. For LEDC, the program that we're offering, um, we're capping our max at $60,000 for the PPP loan. But if you obtain it from another source, it goes up to $10 million. Um, if you want to apply directly through our website, you could do that starting right this second. If you went to www.ledcmetro, that's all one word, dot org forward slash SBA PPP. Again, that's www.ledcmetro.org forward slash SBA PPP. And there's also useful information there if you want to learn more about this product. But I think it's a really fantastic product to keep workers employed, to bring your workers back. We really, really want to help our business clients and the community, um, you know, keep employment going um, to the best of their ability. I mean, this has been, been such a challenging and difficult time for everyone in the business community. So um, we're here to support. We are, you know, high touch, very personalized service. So you will be assigned a loan officer. You'll have someone who's available to help you throughout the entire process. If you had an experience where you tried to apply either, you know, on your own or through a bank and it didn't quite work out, please come to us. Um, we're happy to help, and we will, you know, do everything in our power to help you access this product. Thank you. Marla, thanks so much for that. You know, in the first round of these PPPs, CDFIs were not included in um, in the institutions that were allowed to provide this source. You know, can you talk a little bit about the impact that letting CDFIs be a, a resource, that, what, what you feel like that might have done in terms of helping make these resources available for small businesses? Sure. So at the outset, um, there were a subset of CDFIs of which LADC was a, a part, which are the community advantage lenders, which are lenders that are doing up to $250,000 in lending through the SBA. Um, but that's really just a small subset of the entire industry, which has over a thousand, um, you know, 
organizations throughout the United States. So there was a really limited number of people, not to mention that the funds went away so quickly in the first round that most CDFIs that even belong to that sort of subset weren't able to make any loans successfully, and that includes LABC. So the second round, we were activated and able and had raised enough funds to be able to do this product. Um, but the real disadvantage there is that CDFIs, you know, unlike banks, have close relationships with local small businesses and therefore, you know, can really reach um, groups who may not have access to other, you know, whether that be friends and family funding or just, you know, closer relationships with their bank lenders. Um, You know, so there were a big, as a default of not having included CDFIs in a more broad way, um, it also meant that then local small businesses, minority-owned small businesses, women-owned small businesses, um, low-income small business owners were excluded um, from that first round um, and, and possibly from the second round. Um, there was subsequently a CDFI set aside, which put funding aside specifically for use by CDFIs for the PPP program, but it kind of came late in the game. So that's why it's so important for us to be here um, on this program so that folks know that there are still funds available, as you said, that they can come to a community-based organization that can really help them um, to obtain this. And another thing um, that's important to note is that some banks are actually not offering this product anymore. So um, it may even be just even if you, you know, would be able to access it through your bank that your bank is simply not offering the product anymore. So, um, you know, please use us. We're here at, at a resource for you. And how, many, how, much, how much is available through LEDC right now? How much funding is available? So our cap um, for PVP loans is 60000 um, and that's way above the average that we've been seeing in the applications that have been coming to us. So you have the capacity to do, you know, plenty of loans. So we, you know, we're we're going to blast this out, Marla. We are going to flood you with a. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Know. You. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think there was. There I'm was... sure my loan officers will be so happy with yes. me. No, we really want. You know, this has been like such a huge call to action for LEDC for our staff. People have been working around the clock on our team, and um, I just. Could not be more um, impressed and enthused by my staff's, um, you know, ability and willingness and energy behind this product because you know this is really a defining moment for us, um, and I think for some of our younger staff, it will probably be a defining moment in their career to have gone through this process. And we really want, um, you know, and we'll do everything that we can. I mean, our staff have been working literally around the clock, like 2 a.m., whatever it might be, and we really are committed to putting forth this product. Well, to have moved all of those loans in a, you know, a matter of weeks, you know, while being mm-hmm. an important partner of DEMPED, you know, and while helping with all the micro grants, I mean, you guys have been really busy in this past month. So we want to really yeah. thank you for all your help that you've been doing. Now, let me, uh, let me ask Ms. Ryan, mm-hmm. tell, us, tell us about your gluten-free goodies and tell us, um, tell us what the PPP has meant for, for your business. First, tell us all about your business. How did you get started? And then, you know, and then what, what, what did the PPP do for you? Thank you, Director Whitfield. I want to tell you, um, I want to thank you, actually, because uh, it was at one of these town hall meetings um, close to the beginning of uh, the crisis. Um, you were, um, the panel uh, and you were discussing um, specifically um, businesses of color. And I sat in our business van and bawled my eyes out. And then um, it galvanized me. And um, it, it just made a huge difference. So I thank you. Um, and hello to Daryl, who's been essential to my business as well. Thank you. Um, uh, o Earth Premium Big House uh, is a five year old business. Um, and uh, it's a business that's been bootstrapped from the beginning. Um, we started with a $5,000 Kiva Zip loan, and we're not able to, like many small businesses that are unproven, um, access capital. And um, it's been um, actually um, a very refreshing thing to be able to connect with the LEDC um, uh, because it provided for us, um, a first-time opportunity um, that has meant so much. But uh, we are a bakery that 
um, feel very connected to the district. Uh, we began um, at Fresh Farm Market, uh, and um, then last fall we uh, started at Union Market. Um, and our our uh, we've been able to develop a very strong uh, community base um, that's very important to us and um, to what we do. Um, people who are gluten-free are immunocompromised. Those that must be gluten-free are immunocompromised. And so when the crisis began, um, I made a decision to close the bakery while we learned more about uh, COVID. Um, so that we would have a response that would be protective of our customers that are so important to us. Um, I also had a, um, I had, uh, I have asthma and I needed to address that issue. Um, and just generally, I was hoping to see more testing and contact, the contact tracing. I just needed more information in order to, uh, to, to move forward. Um, and, uh, I, um, the difficulties that we've had um, as a business, um, a small business that uh, it has not had access to capital, um, traditional means of, of capital, uh, actually has ended up being um, important during this time because I think we, we're sort of, um, uh, that struggle has um, helped us to, um, to, to take this present time um, in stride. Uh, so we are currently still closed. Um, however, we're making plans to reopen, and we um, and the, the PPP is, is very important um, to that process. We miss our customers at the DuPont Circle Farmers Market and Penn Quarter and White House and Palisades Farmers Market and and Union Market and can't wait to get back and and and, uh, and connect with our customers again. Uh, so the time that we've been closed has actually been very useful because uh, when you're running a small business, um, there isn't a lot of time to do a lot of the essentials. And um, this time has allowed me to work on aspects of the business that have been neglected. And so it's a difficult time. However, it's provided me with an opportunity to do those things that will allow us to come back better and stronger and really set us up to survive and thrive in this COVID age in which we find ourselves. And then uh, tell, us, uh, tell us how... Uh how it was to apply for the PPP, how long did it take you to get it, and uh, how long did, it, how was that process for you? So, um, we immediately applied um, back in March for the first round, and I uh, reached out to um, my, my local bank, um, and we even tried online, but we missed out on the first round of PPP funding. Um, and so, you know, I'm someone who follows the goings on in Congress, and I was watching that process very carefully. And the moment the second round opened up, uh, I reapplied, and I noticed that um, the LADC had um, had been approved, and I uh, to be a, a lender. And I had connected with them uh, in uh, 2019, and um, had a very long conversation with uh, Daniel Friedman. And um, so when I saw them, I relaxed a bit because I thought, oh, I know them. Um, and I hoped that they remembered me. Uh, and I was very pleasantly surprised to have um, get an email back um, from Daniel, who I knew, and um, from uh, several um, other of their employees who um, I came to know, one of um, and uh they were um, amazing. A friend of mine, um, who's a big supporter of the business, um, uh, and lifts me up when I'm feeling low um, in so many ways, uh, uh, helped me one weekend. We um, 
we went through the revised application and we uh, uh, we got everything together. And um, it took us a while, but we got it done. And uh, and then LEDC uh, jumped in and worked with me to complete the application. And honestly, it was so easy. And um, I mean, they made that part of it very, very easy. And for me, because of um, some of the experiences I've had trying to get um, lending or, yeah, trying to access capital, I was I was scared. I had um, a lack of confidence about um, my credentials. I just, there was this apprehensiveness um, and fear and thinking the worst, but um, uh, Daniel and team um, held my hand and we went through it and there were some very... Um, Saturday night, I remember um, we were speaking around 10 p.m. Um, getting it in, and he promised me that um, my application would be among the first um, that would uh, go in come Monday or, or the day that they, they, they opened uh, the application. And so it was, and I think uh, it was maybe a week later uh, that I got um, that, that they emailed me and let me know that, um, that, that we had gotten along. Well, so the connection, the connection ended up being very, it, it was helpful, and they, they eased the, the, the passage as well. You know, I appreciate you, uh, I appreciate you sharing that for, for so many reasons, because I think, you know, I'm very passionate about access to capital, anybody that knows me knows this. And I think that, uh, you know, I also think that, you know, LEDC and our CDFI community is really here for sort of a singular purpose, which is to help our small businesses, you know, make those connections. And I, uh, and I think that the, the time that is taken to really walk you through that process, you know, it, this is a great example of the great work of LEDC. And it also really is a testament to the to the great staff there. So I, I really I appreciate that, and I want to make sure people know that we, uh, you know, that we have these resources, and that it did not take that long. You know, I think there people had given up hope on this PPP resource, and people need to know that this is you know this is forgivable money. Please, 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 please do apply. Yeah. Um, they're giving me a, a, a wave to, to remind people to press zero, and we actually do have a few people on the phone to, uh, to uh, um, press zero if you have questions. And I think the first question, um, Kim, there's a glare. Kim from Ward Kim 5. Kim, Kim, uh, thank you. Kim Moore from Ward 5 has a question. Ah, uh, yes, I thought this was going to roll into the um, general questions later because it's not about PPP. Oh, okay. It's about um, opening of a, a, a business. We just moved into phase two, and I have some questions about um, the monitor testing clients as they come in. Oh, oh, okay. Well, we can, we can, we can still try for that. Let's, 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 let's go. Okay, <laughs> I'm a fitness studio in Ward Five, um, and as we prepare to get started, I think just making sure that everything is in order um, as we open. And so one of the things, it doesn't say that we're mandated to take temperatures, but I think that we should. And so I didn't know if there was any recommendations or directions on how to do that, like the type of thermometer, how far away you should be standing from somebody, um, any, just hoping for any information to get me started here. Sure. So, Kim, um, I think that the, your best bet is uh, following, obviously, the coronavirus.dc.gov website with all the phase two recommendations in the mayor's order, which I think is very important. But I also would suggest that you follow CDC guidelines as well. And I think that whatever the CDC guidelines are uh, for fitness center and for openings is what you should follow. I don't think it's mandatory uh, for you to take the temperature of your guests coming in. But if that is something that you would like to do as a general practice for your business, I think that that uh, 
uh, would be helpful um, for you to do that. I don't think there's rec specific recommendations on uh, how far apart you have to be or what type of thermometer you have to use. I know that a lot of folks uh, obviously are using uh, the, the sensor ther thermometer at a distance, so I think that would be a good the recommendation. One, um, but I, I, at this time, I don't, I don't think the district has specifically stated any type of thermometers or distance that needs to be used uh, for that. All right, thanks for your call, Kim. Um, next, we're going to go to, uh, to, to Alan, who's a restaurant owner. Um, he's got a question yeah. about landlords. Hi, Alan. Hi, how are you today? Hi there. Um, I, have a, I have two quick questions. Great. Um, our landlord has reached out to us and has asked us specifically how much PPP we have uh, got. Are we required to give them an exact amount? That's question number one. I think that would be for Dan Kaufman. And question number two is within that, what kind of deals are you currently seeing landlords making with tenants? Uh, in the downtown region of uh, D.C. So all, we have four restaurants, and they're all downtown. So I wanted to see if there's some kind of barometer or what you're seeing or you know, measurement of what you're seeing uh, landlords do. Oh, great. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Dan, roughly, what kind of what's, – what's the best deal you've seen so far, Dan? <laughs> uh, well, I'll briefly touch on the, the first issue. Um, are they? Are you legally required to tell them how much PPP you received? Uh, my guess, unless the lease says differently, is, is the answer is no. However, if you're trying to you know, get a payment plan, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing for a landlord to ask for. And if you're trying to get any relief from your landlord, inquiring about the PPP is not uh, I don't think an unreasonable thing to ask, although landlords sometimes are not, well, they understand PPP exists, they don't understand the limitations as to how much money uh, from PPP you can hand over to the landlord in rent and still have it forgiven. So that's obviously something to educate them on if they have uh, misgivings about that. But uh, short answer, no, I don't think it's required, um, unless something's in writing saying otherwise, but it may be something you want to offer in exchange for uh, getting some sort of relief. As far as what sort of deals are being made, I, I've seen it run the gamut, and maybe Daryl can uh, chime in with if he has any other thoughts on that. I mean, what I think is making a lot of sense right now for a lot of restaurants is if you can, during this period where your operations are reduced and you don't know how long the, those reductions will occur, trying to get some sort of what's called percentage rent where you're not paying a set amount and if you have to close, you're not paying anything. And if you are doing well, then you're, you're paying some percentage of your sales where the landlord is being paid a similar amount as they would be under no, what I would call normal circumstances, although who knows what's normal from now on. Um, that, that's what I'm seeing tenants strive for. But, you know, you see it from just, Payment plans being offered for deferment, and that's all landlords are required to do now, and that's all they're giving to some sort of abatement for the, the period prior to this, and then um, normal rent being paid moving forward to abatement for everything prior to now, but now that you're being opened up again, you pay percentage rent. It, it really just depends and uh, on all the factors I talked about before. Um, but there's just a lot of different types of deals being done. Yeah, and, and Dan, I would just, the only thing I would quickly add is the only thing I've seen is sort of an abatement, you know, so no rent during the time of the pandemic, but with the understanding that, or, or with a negotiation to the end of the lease for an additional amount of time, as in like renegotiate, like an early renegotiation for an additional two years just to some degree. So essentially it's an abatement for now with the understanding that you're gonna that maybe you're gonna stay an extra two years. I've seen that I've seen that once, but um, I also haven't dealt a lot with a bunch of downtown places. It's been a lot of smaller places. So um, you know, for the gentleman the, the caller who called in, there 
you know, Dan is right. There's lots of different things that we're seeing. All right. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, all right. Now we've got a, a, a Marjorie. Marjorie has a question for us. Yes, hello. I'm in Ward 4. My name is Marjorie Goldberg. I own the Zenith Gallery and run the Zenith Community Arts Foundation. I have basic two questions. Um, so do you help people get PPP money? Um, I'm, my bank doesn't do it anymore. And I was just online with the SBA, but if D.C. does it, I'd rather go through D.C. That's number one question. And number two question, I want to understand about office buildings. I put a, I have an office building across from, excuse my expression, not my president's hotel, that um, I put on art shows. And I thought that on Monday they could start letting some of the lawyers back in and then they would open up the building, but they haven't done it yet. So I'm wondering what the situation is with law firms and associations and businesses like that. What, um, you know, what, what is the deal on that? So Marjorie, for the, uh, for the office buildings for phase two, I think there's the coronavirus.dc.gov has the office building um, requirements, and there's, you know, if you go to that website, I think it's going to really depend, and every business has to have sort of a an open requirements, and there's checklists that you can check. Um, Tatiana, yeah, wanna... there, there's no prohibition in the mayor's orders for them right. to use, and uh, there is very detailed um, directions, if you call it, um, for non-essential, non-retail businesses on opening. However, the mayor is encouraging, uh, strongly encouraging telework uh, conditions um, for now. Uh, I, do, I do know that uh, there have been several uh, large companies and associations that have put out materials uh, on what is the best way to reopen commercial buildings. But like you were saying, Director, I think it's a case by case, building by building, so um, different, so yeah, yeah, and different firms are going to take different, uh, probably different tax, but I would definitely check coronavirus.dc.gov and look at phase two. Um, so I would, I would check that, and, and I would imagine that the firms around you are all probably doing various and sundry things based on their preparedness and comfort level. That's right. Um, so thanks for that question. And then we have a, I don't want to mispronounce this, but uh, we have a question about debt for forgiveness. Um, so Marjorie, you had a question on. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, and the second question was PPP. And absolutely reach out to LEDC because they absolutely are doing PPP. So please reach out to them for sure. Go to their website. They are doing it. Go to their website, and they, will, they can definitely do that for you. Um, so let's go to uh, Naomi. Um, Naomi Martin from Ward 1. And the question Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I was wondering, Naomi. can you talk a bit about the kinds of records that businesses need to provide to qualify for debt forgiveness? And secondly, what is the maximum amount that can be forgiven, assuming that all proceeds go towards payroll? And then what would be the interest rate for the portion that is not forgiven? Um, I'm going to need my lifeline for that one. So I've got um, my art director lending on WhatsApp here with me. So 100% um, is forgiven if it qualifies. So if you, as you mentioned, if you're going to use it all for payroll expenses, it should all be forgiven, and there shouldn't be any reason why that's not the case. Um, and then, sorry, what was your second question? I think we lost. Or if anyone remembers me. Oh, oh, oh so. Uh, the interest on the portion not forgiven is 1%. Okay. All right, I think we lost, we lost her. But, um, okay. so listen, I would Hopefully say, please re reach out to uh, Nomi. Please reach out to LEDC, and they can definitely uh, help you with those. We are, uh, we are, we were almost out of time, but I want to say, please reach out to LEDC and and follow up because they would be a great resource for you. Um, You'd like to ask yeah, also for Dan or, or Daryl or Marla uh, and Miss Ryan. Do you have any? closing thoughts or any encouraging words, anything that you'd like to share with uh, our audience today that would be good um, for them to know that you haven't already said something that you'd like to share as we as we close with uh, Director Whitfield. 
Dara, why don't we start with you? Um, I can just quickly build on that last question just because I, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but just that we will help people to collect their documentation to understand and determine how much of their loan will be forgiven or to work towards 100% forgiveness. Um, you know, and, it, and PPP is not necessarily for everyone. If they want to talk to us about their options in general, not only PPP, please go to www.ledcmetro.org and look us up and reach out. Thank you. Uh, this is Daryl. I'll just say that um, at the Pro Bono Center, we are, we are here for our neighbors here in the District of Columbia. Um, we know this is a difficult time, and um, our services remain um, free, and um, we, will tr we will help you as best we can, and, um, you know, we remain sort of poised and, and willing and with the help of our great volunteers um, excited to be able to help you through what can be extremely challenging times. So um, we hope you'll work with us. And this is an area, if I can just say quickly that our bakery is looking for a uh, kitchen space or, um, and um, if anyone, uh, if you can reach out to us, to us through our website, that would be really helpful. We need a COVID compliant space, so one that is larger than the one we occupy now. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan any, any final thoughts? Oh, sure. <laughs> Um, not much to say. Uh, if anyone has any questions on uh, my presentation, feel free to contact me either via email or on Twitter. I'm happy to talk further. Uh, Marla, any final thoughts? Sorry, just taking myself off mute. No, um, you know, beyond what was said, I just really encourage people to reach out to us. We're happy to help in any way. Um, any way that your business might be struggling, whether it be through this or any other way that we can assist, including connecting you to the D.C. Bar Pro Bono Legal Center. So just use us as a hub. We're here for you. Great. Tatiana, any final thoughts? No. Great just thank you to all of us, that, the, all of you that participated. We appreciate as our guests and panelists. To those that have called us uh, and reached out, we're here for you. Uh, mm -hmm. We're here on the district's economic recovery team, and I know Director Whitfield is very much there with her team at DSLBD, and I know all our directors are during this time. Uh, just continue to stay safe and healthy. Yeah, and I'll just say that, you know, we know at, uh, at DSLBD that these are, you know, these continue to be unprecedented times that, you know, figuring out the value of your lease, figuring out where the economic resources are. These are scary times. We do not have all the answers, but we will continue to put the cobble together resources and cobble together solutions together. So, you know, on behalf of Deputy Mayor Falcecchio, on behalf of Mayor Bowser, you know, we want to thank the small business community for your steadfast, you know, efforts that you continue to sort of continue on. We, uh, we are here to figure it out with you. And, and we will continue to be there for you. So call on us, and, and we will get through this together stronger. So thank you very much for watching, and, uh, and we continue to uh, be there for you. Thank you very much.